Bon, bonjour tout le monde. Donc, euh, ça me fait grand plaisir de présenter le, le conférencier d'aujourd'hui. Il s'agit de Klaas-Jan Tilhoi. Tu l'as prononcé hein? euh, Donc, Klaas est un nouveau professeur à TU uh, Eindhoven. C'est l'université uh, technologique ou technique de Eindhoven. Euh, je crois qu'il est toujours attaché euh, à ICN2, qui est l'Institut de nanosciences et nanotechnologie. Plan de nanotechnologie et nanosciences. Oui. Ah, yeah. euh, et puis, euh, donc, mais je pense que son groupe est en, est en voyage en ce moment, c'est ça? Vous êtes en train de déménager vers euh, Eindhoven. Et puis, bon, avant tout ça, Klaas a fait des études, euh, un doctorat à euh, Amsterdam, à Molf, c'est ça? Une bonne mémoire. Et euh, alors, évidemment, un postdoc à ICFO, c'est là que moi et Louis, on a, on a connu Klaas. Donc aujourd'hui, Klaas va nous parler de euh, thermodynamique ultra rapide dans le graphène peut-être twisté. OK. Uh, yeah, we'll do this in English if that's OK. Um, yeah, good. OK. Thanks for this very nice uh, introduction, Amache, and thanks a lot for, uh, for inviting me. Um, and thanks a lot for coming. So to just give you a little bit of a background, um, I just show you here. This is uh, yeah, where Louis, Amache and me met. This is in... Uh, This is Barcelona, it has a nice beach, nice buildings, and I am currently partially working uh, somewhere around here, which is this Catalan Institute of Nanoscience and Nanotechnology. And then if you would go inside there into the Institute, you would find here my lab with some optical tables and a bunch of people. And if you want to know more about what we're doing in my group, we have this uh, website ultrafastdynamics.com. So we work on ultrafast dynamics especially in, uh, in nanoscale uh, systems. And uh, uh, I am now uh, in, a, in a kind of a funny uh, situation where uh, there's a probability of finding me in Spain of about 20% and about 80% of finding me in, in Eindhoven, which looks like this. There's no beach, but there's also buildings. Um, and I'm moving my lab or most of my lab to Eindhoven uh, in two weeks. So we're packing it up uh, at the moment. Um, yeah. So these are, this is just an overview of some of the topics uh, that we're working on. So as you can see, there's quite a few different things. We don't actually study elephants, um, but we do study like structural properties of materials. We study a lot of optoelectronic properties of materials and uh, a, a very a prototypical materials that we study are quantum materials. So 2D layered uh, quantum materials. So I don't have to introduce them too much. There's, of course, graphene that's semi-metallic. There's also insulating and semiconducting ones, superconducting ones, and ferromagnetic ones. And they're very interesting optical, optoelectronic, magnetic, and structural properties. Now, what I find one of the most interesting, th about, interesting things about them is that you can stack them on top of each other and get atomically sharp interfaces, which is something you cannot easily do when you grow materials on top of each other because you need lattice matching. In this case, you can just put them on top of each other in atomic proximity. So you get proximity effects and you can get combinations of the different of the, uh, properties of the different materials that together constitute one of these Van der Waals uh, stacks. Another thing that's very interesting about them is that they have a completely new degree of freedom that you don't have when you grow materials on top of each other, which is this twist angle. So you can change the, the orientation with one of the materials or the same material with respect to the material uh, below it. Um, So that's a little bit of the introduction uh, of the materials that we study. Now, what I'm going to do in this uh, in this colloquium is uh, basically try to answer these three questions. So how do electrons cool in magic angle twisted bilayer graphene? Until now, this was an open question. How does electron heat diffuse in graphene? So if you create electronic heat in graphene, how does that move around? And then this is a more applied question, like can 2D materials compete with silicon? Because there are now roadmaps where people in the semiconductor industry are counting on 2D materials to actually uh, become part of chips in the long run. So we, we need to, to find good reasons to actually do this. And then of course you have to compare with the, with the prototypical material that's being used now, which is silicon. Okay, so let's start with the first topic. Uh, so this is about graphene, twisted graphene and cooling. So very quickly, I'm sure you're, you're quite familiar with this, but graphene has all these special properties. It has this very high charge mobility, even at room temperature, super broadband absorption, doesn't matter which color of light you shine on it, it's going to be absorbed. It also has very high thermal conductivity, 
several thousand of watt per meter Kelvin, similar to carbon nanotubes. Um, and that's all very nice. Another very nice thing is that you can quite easily tune the carrier density or the Fermi energy. This is where it's different from metals, because in metals you always have this really large Fermi energy. Here you can really tune to this situation where you have very few carriers in the system, or this situation where you even have holes in the system instead of electrons. So that's quite uh, quite um, uh, interesting, and it's very easy to do this just with the back gate. You apply a voltage, and this shifts your Fermi energy. Now, a less well-known, uh, but for me, uh, at least equally intriguing property uh, of graphene is what happens after you shine light on this uh, on this material. And what happens then is that you actually get multiple free carriers for the price of a single absorbed photon. So you absorb a single photon, you get this very high uh, energy electron sitting all the way up here in the conduction band. It will cascade down in several steps, and at each step, it will kick out an electron from the Fermi C into a higher kinetic energy state. And uh, um, yeah, you can you can actually use these hot carriers that you create like that for all kinds of applications uh, that I will briefly show a bit later. So this is something that we started studying about a decade ago. Uh, we did some pump probe measurements. We predicted this effect of, of hot carrier multiplication, um, and um, um, yeah, that's 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 the, the 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 particle picture, of course, and this is now the thermodynamic picture. So what you're basically doing is that you're heating up the electron system. So you have more of these carriers at higher energies. So that means you've broadened this Fermi dark distribution. So that's what you're seeing here. Whatever color of light you shine on it, you're going to be broadening this Fermi dark distribution. Um, it also shifts a little bit the chemical potential, and then it will cool back down where the, to a state where the electron temperature is equal to the lattice temperature. This is what we call the, the ultra-fast uh, thermodynamics. And this is something that you can actually uh, uh, use for, for certain applications. So you can use this for the conversion of light, for the emission of light, and the detection of light. Um, and this is a review um, that we actually wrote together a few years ago during the pandemic um, about how you can actually use these hot carriers, this ultra-fast thermodynamics, uh, and 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 apply it to to convert and emit and detect light. Um, and there are several applications associated with this. I will not go into too much detail, um, but you can use this for for data communication. So detect telecom light. Uh, you can detect uh, uh, also terahertz light even, and you can convert, for example, uh, a terahertz waveform into a terahertz waveform with a higher frequency, just by shining it on this material and using the fact that you have this fast heating and cooling. Now, you can also uh, use this material to study more fundamental uh, properties. Um, and for that, you can use this, uh, this photo uh, uh, response, which is also used for several of these applications that I was showing before. Um, and the way this works is actually uh, the photothermoelectric effect. So you have a, a sheet of graphene. Sorry, it's here. You have two different gates below it where you apply a different voltage. So you have a different z coefficient on the different parts of the channel, and you shine light, that creates this hot electron state, this, this, this higher electron temperature, and then what you have is that you get a local voltage that is created here at this junction. And this is created on a time scale of femtoseconds, because this cascade that I was showing of electrons, that's electron-electron interaction taking place at tens of femtoseconds time scale. And immediately after that, you have this hot electron temperature, and immediately after that, you have this local photovoltage generation at this junction. So you can do this in tens of femtoseconds. So it's a very, very fast uh, process, and it's also very efficient because all this light uh, that is absorbed is turned into electronic energy of the graphene system. Um, now, an interesting thing you can do for more fundamental studies is that you can, uh, instead of uh, shining just light on it, you can shine pulsed light, and you can come with two pulses that are both ultra short, so they have a time scale, let's say, of tens or hundreds of femtoseconds, and they come with a little bit of a delay in time, and then you can study the actual dynamics that are happening in the system. So what happens is that at delay time zero, that means that both pulses are coming at the same time, you generate a little bit less photocurrent than when these two pulses are coming very far apart. The reason for this is that it's a little bit nonlinear. So if they're coming very far apart, they're each contributing independently. So you get a little bit more photocurrent generation if they're independently contributing than when they're contributing right at the same time because of this sublinearity. 
Now, what's interesting is that the recovery of this signal from the slightly smaller signal to the slightly larger signal is actually proportional or it's, it's, it's reflecting the actual dynamics of your system. So you can see here these cooling dynamics of the system as a function of delay between these two uh, uh, pump pulses. So you have access to the cooling dynamics of the system. Now that's going to be very interesting for this first uh, part of the talk, which is how electrons cool in magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. So for this, I do need to acknowledge uh, several people first. So most importantly, my postdoc Jake, who's been doing most of the measurements and most of the work, um, and also our previous postdoc uh, in the group that helped a lot with, with some of the measurements and setting uh, up the experiments. Then some of the uh, uh, samples were made, uh, at, or actually all of these samples were made uh, by our collaborators at ICFO, the group of Dmitry Evitov, who now moved uh, to Munich. And we have theory support from uh, Leonid Levitov at MIT and his former postdoc, Hiro, who is now in, uh, in Tokyo, and then uh, funding support. Okay, so this is about magic angle twisted bilayer graphene. So this is where you have this additional degree of freedom where you twist, in this case, a single sheet of graphene on top of another single sheet of graphene. So it's two of the same flakes, but you change their angle. And uh, what you then get is the formation of a Mare super lattice. So you see that depending on the twist angle, you get periodicities that are either smaller or larger. Don't look at it for too long because you get a little bit dizzy. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll stop it soon. Um, and then what's really interesting is at certain angles, so around one degree, you actually get the formation of flat bands. So of course, graphene is known for its Dirac cones, but what happens in this case is that you have a small band gap and flat bands within this band gap. And these flat bands, of course, give rise to strongly correlated effects. And in this case, even the, 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 yeah, the, the demonstration of anomalous superconductivity below one Kelvin. So there's uh, some very interesting things going on with lots of open questions still. So what is the role of the phonons, for example, like in these Cooper pair formation for the superconductivity? Is there any role of electron umklop scattering in transport? And even more simple, what are the cooling dynamics of this, uh, of this system? And can we study these cooling dynamics and learn something about the role of phonons and these umklop scatterings? So that's something that we, uh, we address in this work. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our, our graphene photodetector type samples. So we have these two split gates. We have the PN junction where we generate uh, this photovoltage. Now, in this case, of course, we don't just have a graphene channel, but we have a channel consisting of twisted bilayer graphene. And then we're going to do these type uh, of dynamics measurements, and we're going to see how fast these systems cool. And we're going to do that comparing two different samples. We also have a third one, but I, I don't show it here, but it looks very similar to the one on the right. So here we have normal Bernal stacked twist, uh, a non-twisted bilayer graphene, so zero degree angle. And on the right, pointer has a, quite a delay. Um, here we have the twisted bilayer graphene, in this case of 1.24 degrees. And we have another sample that was around, around 1.08 uh, degrees, but I, I don't show it. And then we have these pit gates, so we can look at the dynamics. And this is uh, one of the main results. I just show it to you right away. So this is at low temperature, 25 Kelvin. So instead of this dip, now I subtract the background and flip it around. So what you then see is the Bernal stack graphene in red is cooling quite slowly. The twisted bilayer graphene is cooling much, much faster. So the only thing that's different in these two measurements is that you twisted one layer of the bilayer graphene by one degree. So in one case, you get cooling that is several tens of picoseconds. You twist the sheet by one degree, and suddenly you get picosecond cooling, so much faster. So that's quite striking. Um, so we wanted to understand that better. So we looked at the temperature dependence. And what you see is that at room temperature, they're cooling more or less equally fast. So it's like a few picoseconds. But then once you start cooling down, the normal non-twisted graphene starts cooling down more and more slowly. This is because these electrons cool down by giving their energy to, to phonons, acoustic phonons, optical phonons. And of course, when you cool down the system, there's a lower population of these phonons. So it's, it's more difficult to transfer this energy to these phonons. So uh, cooling uh, through electron phonon interactions becomes more slow. Now, in the case of the twisted bilayer graphene uh, near the magic angle, that doesn't happen at all. So it's equally fast at room temperature as it is at, at even 10 Kelvin. So this already tells you that 
probably there's some involvement of phonons with very low energy because even down to 10 Kelvin, you're not affected at all by a lower population uh, of your phonons. So there must be low energy phonons uh, involved. Um, that's what I'm saying here. So we studied a little bit more because of course we have this, this gay tunability of the system. So what we did here is we started to look uh, close to uh, a filling factor of four. So this means that uh, the whole Brillouin zone is filled uh, uh, with four electrons. Um, and what you then see, so basically we're, we're just changing the, the, the Fermi energy. Um, and this is like the, the maximum filling of the Brillouin zone. And what you see is that both uh, uh, with holes and with electrons, what you get is much slower dynamics when you're uh, close to this uh, full filling. Yeah, yeah very good question. I, I will answer that question in a few slides, if that's okay. Uh, otherwise, I I, uh, I lose the, the the suspension, right? So it's uh, the suspense. Um, but yeah, it, it it's yeah. We'll we'll, we'll see the answer in, in a few slides. So so and actually the, the answer is a little bit here as well. So so things do depend on you know, the Marais pattern, because there's something going on when you fill this unit cell of the Marais pattern with four electrons. So there must be something related with, with this uh, Marais pattern. And um, so you very clearly see this. So it's not something that the twisted bilayer graphene is more defective or more disordered. It's really something that's tunable just by, by gating. And you can actually get very long cooling. So it's not an effect of, of just having bad quality uh, material. Um, so yeah, this is this picture um, where you have this full filling um, uh, of the flat band. So the picture is that uh, you get slower cooling because you have some kind of bottleneck because yeah, Pauli exclusion principle, you cannot put more electrons there. So the electrons stay at the parabolic uh, conduction band. So this gives you then uh, an interband cooling bottleneck in the case of full filling. And now we get to the to the explanation. So what's going on is that um, you actually have very low energy phonons from the uh, Marais pattern. So this gives rise to new phonon uh, bands with very low energy. So of course, you, you don't just have the normal graphene with its typical phonons, but you have additional phonons from the Marais pattern. And these are very low energy that you can couple to. And now the question is, how do you couple to these uh, phonons? Because your, your Dirac cone or your parabolic, parabolic band, they have really... You know, very high dispersion, these very low energy phonons will have super super flat dispersion. So it's, it's not so easy to couple between those. Um, but there's a trick uh, that nature kind of invented for us in the system, and that is umklap scattering. So this is very well known for phonons. So with phonons at room temperature, uh, umklap scattering is dominating uh, uh, the, 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 the scattering of, of, of phonons. Uh, so it's a process where you scatter out of the pre one zone and you fall back into its own pre one zone. This is how you lose momentum. Um, now, this has also been observed uh, at very low temperature between electrons. So electron-electron umklap scattering. And as far as, far as far as we know, this is the first observation of an electron-phonon umklap scattering process where uh, an electron couples to a phonon by folding out and back uh, uh, out of the Brillouin zone. And what's happening here is that, of course, you have two Brillouin zones. So you have the, uh, the very large Brillouin zone associated with the flat bands because they, of course, have these localized electrons because of the flat band, very high mass, so they're not moving anywhere. So very large Brillouin zone. On top of that, you have this quite large super lattice period in real space. So that's this picture. So you have these, these different uh, sites where you have these localized electrons, um, but your Marais pattern can be tens of nanometers because your twist angle is just one degree. So you have a quite large uh, uh, super lattice uh, period, which in momentum space gives you a very small Brillouin zone. So you have the large Brillouin zone from the localized electrons, but on top of that, the small Brillouin zone from the super lattice. And this means that you can have processes where you have these umklap scatterings um, yeah, where you couple outside of your super lattice Brillouin zone and you can fold back and by that overcome this huge momentum mismatch between the electrons and the phonons. So this is a bit the picture in, in energy momentum space. So you have these, these large uh, energy electrons and they want to couple to these very low energy phonons. 
with a huge momentum mismatch and they get this additional momentum by scattering out of the Brion zone and then folding back so that they can lose quite a significant amount of energy even though they're coupling with low energy phonons. So this is the, the picture we had. And it turns out that this actually corresponds really well with analytical theory of these processes. So this is done uh, by Professor Leonid Levitov uh, at MIT and, uh, and Hiro in, uh, in Tokyo. So they have an analytical theory with not a single uh, variable fit parameter. So what we use in that model or they use is just the deformation potential that is known for, for normal single layer graphene. So, okay, the value is debated a little bit, but it's somewhere between 10 and 20 electron volt in most papers. So what we find is that if we use 16 electron volt or even plus minus uh, four, so that's the, the variation you see here, you can actually, with a purely analytical theory of this umklapp scattering process, uh, describe very well quantitatively the data that we observe uh, at low temperature. And at high temperature, uh, what they predict is actually that the number will be the same. So that's very much uh, consistent. So what we believe is that uh, this actually explains some results that were published just a few years ago in Nature, where they saw that for uh, angles deviating from zero degree and then going up and then towards three degrees, it's already down again, you have a broadening of a certain Raman mode. And they ascribe this to strong electron phonon coupling. So strong electron phonon coupling, you got a broadening of this mode and it happens somewhere around this, this, this kind of magic angle around one degree. Uh, but it's not as critical this angle as it is for superconductivity. Um, so what we believe is that this uh, a similar strong electron phonon interaction through umclap processes could uh, uh, explain these results uh, that they saw there. So to summarize this part, so uh, we see this, this, this very strong difference in cooling. Um, so you can actually control the cooling just by changing by one degree um, uh, uh, the top sheet of your of your bilayer system and get much faster cooling, which occurs through a novel uh, umclap uh, assisted electron phonon coupling mechanism. Another aspect of this that's interesting is that you're not only changing the energy dynamics, but also the spatial dynamics, because what's happening in fact in the non-twisted uh, sample is that because the coupling to the phonons is so slow, there's a different relaxation or cooling mechanism that takes over. And this is diffusive cooling. So basically what happens is that you shine light in a small spot. This cannot release its energy to the phonon system. So the spot just starts broadening and by that it cools down. So this is something we call diffusive cooling. And that's something that happens for this non-twisted sample. Now for the uh, case of the uh, 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 twisted sample close to magic angle, what you see is that the cooling is so fast that actually there's no cooling spatially. So there's no spatial spreading of this heat. So you're also controlling the diffusion just by changing by one degree uh, this, uh, this sheet. So we thought that was, uh, that was quite interesting. So this is something that is uh, under review for, for a bit too long, but uh, okay. Hopefully it will come out still uh, somewhere this year. Um, so the answer is how does this cooling happen? Well, through umclap assisted electron phonon scattering through interaction with low energy super lattice phonons. And that brings me uh, to the second part of this talk. It's a little bit connected, of course, to the previous part, because now we're going to be looking specifically at this diffusion of electronic heat. So something that we saw was dominating in the end the cooling dynamics for the non-twisted system. So in this case, we're going to use just purely monolayer graphene, no twists, no bilayer, just monolayer graphene. This is a collaboration uh, with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with, with several people at my institute in Spain, especially uh, Alex, he did all the measurements. We had theory support from Alessandro Principi uh, in Manchester. The sample came from ICFO with BN from our Japanese collaborators. And of course, again, the funding. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna do uh, a spatial temporal measurements. So we're not just gonna look at energy dynamics, but we're also going to look at how this energy dynamics changes when you change the spatial offset between the pump and the probe. So that's going to give us access to diffusion. So diffusion process can be seen as follows. So basically you dump particles or energy or heat, whatever you want, in let's say a Gaussian spot. Then if you wait as a function of time, you will see that this Gaussian spot will be broadening. And this broadening will be governed by a diffusion uh, coefficient, the diffusivity, um, 
that is linear in the square of the width of this Gaussian pulse. So what we're going to have in this technique is that we're going to have nanometer spatial accuracy, a femtosecond temporal resolution. So we have very high accuracy with, with which we can look at the diffusion of electronic heat uh, in the system. So as I said, um, this uh, uh, width squared uh, scales with the delay in time and this diffusivity, that's the parameter that we're going to be extracting here. So we're going to take a kind of similar uh, device again. So it's a graphene channel. It's around a micron. Yeah, so it's um, it, it's in a way not a super resolution technique, but it's a relative super resolution technique because you can imagine um, that if you have good enough signal to noise, even if this, if this Gaussian that has a width of a micron broadens by a nanometer, if your signal to noise ratio is good enough, you're going to see that broadening by just one nanometer. So your resolution, your, your relative resolution of broadening is just limited by signal to noise. And in our case, we can get down to 10 nanometers of broadening uh, of a one micron spot. So you cannot resolve very small features, but you can resolve very small amounts of broadening. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're, we're still just diffraction limited. Um, so we have a sample uh, uh, that is also a whole bar, so we can do electric uh, measurements, so we can get mobilities. Again, we can change uh, uh, the potential, get a Fermi, uh, change the, the Fermi energy, get a PN junction, and get a photovoltage, which is in the end what we're going to be measuring. So in this case, again, it's an optoelectronic measurement. So we shine light, but we probe uh, currents or voltages. So what we're going to do now is we're going to shine, again, a ultra-fast laser pulse, which is going to create an electron temperature in the graphene channel, which is going to start spreading out. Then we're going to do the same thing on the other side of the junction with a second pulse, which is going to be absorbed, change the electron temperature, and then start diffusing out. Then at some point, both of these diffusing electronic heat uh, blobs, let's say, they will meet at the interface where they generate a photovoltage. So if you shine light just here in the center of the of the system, you don't generate any photovoltage because it's all symmetric, right? But at this junction, there's symmetry breaking, so you can generate a net current. And then what we're going to do is we're actually going to uh, uh, specifically look not at just the photovoltage created by the left pulse or the right pulse, but we're going to look at how the heat from the left pulse affects the heat from the right pulse and how that generates a photovoltage. Because that way you have like a start-stop type of experiment where you can look at diffusion. Um, so basically what we're going to do now is we're going to change both the spatial and the temporal offset of these two pulses. So we're going to change the delay in time and we're going to change symmetrically the offset with respect to this junction. So you can already imagine that if you know if you if you if you make delta x really large, so you're exciting very far away from this junction, it will take more time to reach this junction where the photovoltage is is, is generated. Um, another way to see it is that the higher your diffusivity, the faster it does create uh, a photovoltage. So this is how we're actually sensitive to the diffusivity in the system. So let's go straight to the data. So what we're showing here is the width. Uh, of, 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 of the signal that we get, the interacting heat signal as a function of pulse delay. So it, it, in reality, it's, it's a little bit more complicated, but, but the best way to see it is that this width that we're getting is identical to the width you would get if you would have a single pulse and you would look at the broadening of that single pulse. It's completely equivalent what we're doing with these two pulses and changing the relative uh, uh, space, uh, spatial and temporal offset. And then what you're seeing is that, uh, sorry, as a function of time, you see that the width is getting larger. So this is time zero, because of course it doesn't matter which pulse comes first, it's symmetric. So the more delay between the two pulses, the larger the broadening. And then the slope is your diffusivity. Now the nice thing is, we can also measure electronic transport. So we can see if the diffusivity that we're getting makes any sense. Um, and the way it makes sense is through the Einstein relation. So the Einstein relation uh, in the case where uh, uh, is basically uh, uh, telling you how the mobility is connected with the diffusivity. And this is the case uh, uh, specifically where electronic charge is moving and electronic heat carried by charge is moving. So there, there are no phonons involved here. 
um, you can actually get the same equation when you solve the Wiedemann front uh, equation. So all the all the German uh, speaking uh, or German name uh, famous scientists they, they agree on this formula. So so it would be really nice if it also agrees with our data. So what we did is that we measured uh, the mobility. Uh, what I show here, so uh, through uh, through four probe measurements. What I show here is the, is the momentum relaxation time, which is of course uh, uh, related to the mobility, and it's on the order of a few hundred femtoseconds. So we have quite high mobility samples. It's a few hundred femtoseconds be before you get momentum relaxation. And you can uh, um, uh, connect that to, uh, we, we of course also know the Fermi energy, so slightly higher Fermi energy, you get a slightly longer momentum relaxation time. And then through this equation, we can get the diffusivity, which is on the order of 2000 centimeters squared per second, okay? So let's plot a diffusivity of 2000 centimeters squared per second into our data. And it actually fits uh, quite nicely. So we were very uh, assured when we saw this. Also slightly disappointed because of course it means that everything makes sense. So there's nothing uh, exciting about it. Um, but then we started looking a little bit better. We realized that there, there's something weird about these data, which is that there's this offset that's different between the high Fermi energy and the low Fermi energy. And in fact, from our spot sizes, we were expecting the data to start somewhere here, so much lower. So there seems to be something going on that that, that changes this offset. So where's this offset uh, coming from? So exactly, it's, it's even like from theory, we were expecting it to, to start even down here. Um, yeah, okay, so this is, this is uh, just converting thermal diffusivity into a thermal conductivity that also matches theory. So we get about 100 watt per meter Kelvin. Which also makes sense because uh, heat transport in graphene is known to be dominated by phonons. So the phonons have a higher thermal conductivity than electrons. Uh, it's about an order of magnitude difference. Uh, in any case, so we wanted to look at what's happening here in, in the center. Um, and now the important thing to realize is that in the center, you're in a quite special uh, regime time-wise. Because we have a time resolution of about 100 femtoseconds. That's our delta T. We have electron-electron interactions that take place on a time scale of tens of femtoseconds. And we measured our momentum relaxation time, which is on the order of a few hundred femtoseconds. So we can probe the system at a time where the only interaction is between the electrons, but there's no interaction yet with any phonons. And that is a hydrodynamic uh, uh, regime because you only have electrons interaction interacting with electrons. So just to explain it in a little bit more detail, because I'm not sure if everybody is super familiar with this. I'm sure you are with this. This is just diffusive transport, bounce, bounce uh, up on, 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 on electrons and phonons and impurities. So you have a certain mean free path. So now we don't use time scales, but length scales, because that's what device people uh, prefer to think about typically. Uh, if you make your, your system very small, you can get ballistic transport where you only scatter off the sides. So these two, most people know, this one is a little bit less uh, well known, I think. So this is the regime uh, where you have hydrodynamic transport. So the way you can see this is that instead of small electrons, the electrons are actually really large. Of course, not, not really, but that's the way to picture it because that way they're like all interacting just with other electrons. So they're interacting more with electrons than with impurities. And you can imagine that if you want to have transport of such a system, it's more like a viscous liquid. This is also why it's called the hydrodynamic regime. So it's more like a water type flow through a pipe. And this is the regime that you get uh, when you have a length scale of your of your system or your or your or your or your or your, your time resolution equivalently that is in between the interaction length or time of the electrons and in the interaction time or length where you have interaction with phonons. So around time zero in our experiment, we're in this hydrodynamic regime. Where you have this viscous flow. This is a topic that <clears throat> that gained quite a lot of attention uh, uh, over the last few years um, because you can get really funny transport properties where you have these whirlpools like water but then electrons. So you inject electrons into a system and they start flowing back. So you can measure like negative resistances between certain uh, electrodes. Um, so that got a lot of attention. Of course this is not a measurement but, but theory that is consistent with the measurements that they did. By now, there are some uh, near field uh, techniques where they actually do manage to, yeah, to see more clear indications of this kind of viscous transport of electron systems. Okay, last complication uh, of this whole story 
is that within the hydrodynamic regime, you have two sub regimes. So you have the Fermi liquid regime and the Dirac fluid regime. And the difference is how the Fermi energy or the Fermi temperature, it's just a Boltzmann scaling, um, relate to each other. So in the case where you have a relatively uh, 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 large Fermi temperature, uh, um, yeah, Fermi temperature and a relatively small electron temperature, you're in a Fermi liquid regime. Then if you have a relatively large electron temperature, but a small Fermi temperature, you're in a Dirac fluid regime. And the best way to understand what that entails is by looking at the Fermi Dirac distribution in the two cases. So in the case of the Fermi liquid, you actually have a quite large Fermi energy. So you only have electrons in the conduction band or only holes in the valence band. Now in the Dirac fluid case, you're on the right, you have quite a lot of broadening because you have a large electron temperature and your Fermi uh, energy or temperature is quite small. So you're close to the Dirac point. So what you then have is a simultaneous presence of holes in the valence band and electrons in the conduction band. And this gives rise to, uh, yeah, to, to novel phenomena um, in this regime. Um, so the first observation <coughs> of what happens there in this Dirac fluid regime um, was a, a work done at Columbia University where they saw <coughs> that at very low temperatures and extremely clean samples where they could get really, really close to the Dirac point, they saw a breakdown of the wiedemann franz law and the Einstein equation. So basically what that means is that charges are moving very slowly. That makes sense. It's a very viscous uh, electron liquid. So charge yeah, is moving slowly. But it turns out that the heat can move very fast because the heat can actually be carried by electrons and holes moving in the same direction. Now that doesn't carry any charge, but it can carry a lot of heat. So you can heat transport that is faster than charge transport. Now, what is nice coming back to our experiment is that we actually have control <coughs> over the two knobs that make up this phase diagram. So we have the laser power with which we can tune the electron temperature, more power, more heating. And we have a gate voltage that tunes our Fermi temperature, our Fermi energy. So we can tune all the way through this phase space. So let's do that. So we now go just to time zero. So no uh, uh, time delay, both pulses are coming at the same time. And we're going to be scanning both across RPN junction and along RPN junction. Um, in this case, it's, it's, it's just across. And we're going to look in the two extreme cases what the spatial extent is there at time zero. And what you see is that both for the PN junction and the NP junction, you see that if you're <clears throat> at low electron temperature and high Fermi temperature, you see a slightly smaller spot. If you on the other uh, uh, side are, where are we? Yeah, there we go. Here in the middle, you have a high electron temperature and a low Fermi temperature. So you, there you are in this Dirac fluid regime and you see a larger blob. So the really nice thing is that I didn't do any normalization or scaling because in both cases, you get very similar magnitude of the signal. But you can clearly see here from the raw data that this, the, the, the blobs on the sides are smaller than the ones in the middle. Uh, so that's an indication that, yeah, maybe there is indeed some kind of larger heat spreading going on as the Dirac fluid regime. And then in this case, we actually scan through the whole phase space, both across and along the junction. And what you see in color is the amount of broadening. So red is more broadening, blue is less broadening. So what you see here uh, is, is, is quite close to that phase diagram that I was showing. You see in the center and, and diagonally spreading out, you see more spreading and outside you see less spreading. Um, so there was this picture. So that seems very consistent with this picture of Fermi liquid and Dirac fluid. Uh, by the way, we are here at, at a quantum institute. So this is a, a quantum critical phase transition, um, just for those who are interested. So uh, we also did theory on this. So this is where Alessandro Principi uh, modeled the whole system. Um, and he um, uh, can, can calculate the amount of broadening in this hydrodynamic regime, both in the Fermi liquid and Dirac fluid case. And he can get, <coughs> can get uh, an amount of broadening that is on the order of a few micrometers when you're close enough to the Dirac point, which is very consistent with what we're seeing in our data. Now, what is interesting about the simulations, and we can actually correlate that uh, with our data as well, is that we can get an estimate of the diffusivity. And what he uh, predicts and what we also see in our data is diffusivities that are well beyond 100,000 centimeters squared per second. 
So this is more than two orders of magnitude larger than the diffusivity that you get in a diffusive regime. So just by being very close to the drug point and by having the situation where the interaction is mainly among the electrons and without interacting with the phonons, you get a situation of very, very um, uh, fast broadening, very fast diffusion of electronic heat. So that is then a picture we have. So we can plot here indeed like a diffusivity of 100,000 that lives just for a few hundred femtoseconds. And then indeed you end up with a starting point that's somewhere here. So we, we cannot resolve this dynamics exactly, but instead what we get is like a higher begin point around time zero. And this explains why in this measurement where we had a lower Fermi energy, we indeed start uh, at, a, at a higher uh, starting point. So we then end up <coughs> with the following picture. So in the uh, Fermi liquid regime, you have maybe some ballistic broadening, but nothing special. And then after a few hundred femtoseconds, you get diffusive broadening with this diffusivity that's on the order of a, a, a thousand centimeters squared per second. Now, if instead we're in this Dirac fluid regime, so close to the Dirac point with a high electron temperature, you have this short lived but very fast broadening of electronic heat, which we show here with these, these wiggly lines that are spreading out a lot uh, in just a few hundred femtoseconds. And after that, of course, you get the same diffusive uh, broadening. Now, what is interesting about uh, especially this part is that you actually can <coughs> calculate from the thermal diffusivity a thermal conductivity. We did that, and what you get is several tens of thousands of watt per meter Kelvin. So even though before I was saying transport of heat in graphene is dominated by phonons, that's true in, in, in equilibrium, but there's a very short-lived amount of time, a few hundred femtoseconds, where if you're close enough to the direct point, it's actually the electron heat transport that's dominating. And it's more than an order of magnitude larger than the already record high uh, thermal conductivity of the phonon system, of the phonons in the system. So um, that is not completely crazy. Uh, there were actually already theoretical predictions of numbers like this. And in fact, it just diverges the closer you get to the direct point. So you can get extremely, extremely large thermal conductivities in the system. Now, all room temperature, yeah, yeah. So it's the first room temperature observation uh, of a hydrodynamic heat transport of of electrons, um, at least at that time. There, there. Well, there was one exactly at the same time, yeah. Um, using like tip-based uh, studies. Um, so of course that's very interesting from a fundamental perspective, but we think it's also very interesting uh, from an applied perspective because even though it's short-lived, the amount of broadening you get is more than a micron. So we think that can be very useful to actually start avoiding your, your, your PCBs from, from, from looking like this. If you have hotspots, very tiny hotspots, if you can have some graphene there that spreads out this heat very fast over, over at least a micron or so, you can avoid the breakdown that then happens because this hotspot starts getting even hotter and eventually breaking down your device. So that's something we're, we're studying now uh, uh, more from an applied uh, perspective. So the question, how does electron heat diffuse in graphene? The answer is, well, extremely fast, at least in the Dirac uh, fluid regime. And that's something we <clears throat> we published a few years ago in, in Nature Nano. I should ask about the timing. Um, five or ten more minutes. So I have a third topic that I will then just go through uh, quickly. Is that okay? Yeah, it's a bit related to this. So it's it's related to, to thermal uh, thermal transport. Um, and and it's it's a more applied topic, so it's, it's basically trying to answer if 2D materials can actually compete with silicon, uh, specifically in terms of heat transport. So again, to avoid overheating, but then now focusing completely on the phonons, so no electrons. Uh, it's a col collaboration between a lot of people uh, at ICN2 and some theory support from people in Utrecht and, uh, and Liège. So we know silicon, it has a pretty high thermal conductivity. It's, uh, it's 150 watt per meter Kelvin, not as high as, as graphene or carbon nanotubes. Uh, but it's large enough um, to avoid this uh, from happening. Now, how does that look like for, for TMDs? So transition metal dichocogonite, so semiconducting layered materials. Well, they're a little bit worse. They're more like on, on, the, on the tens of watt per meter Kelvin. Um, but that is for bulk material. Now, what happens if you start thinning down these materials? So this is the case of silicon. So what happens is that as soon as you start thinning down silicon, the thermal conductivity drops more than an order of magnitude. So you get all kinds of problems of interactions with the interface and the surface that makes that your thermal transport is much and much less efficient. And that could be a problem 
if you want to make transistors with very uh, thin silicon or flexible transistors, for example. Now, what if you start thinning down MOSE2? That is something that we studied. Uh, so we made these suspended uh, flakes down to a monolayer. So this is the proof that there's actually like a flake there. Uh, we can iron this out just by heating it up. Um, so you don't see any very well that there's a flake, but there is a flake. And we can do this all the way <coughs> down to a monolayer. And we have very good uh, crystallinity. It's very flat, not a lot of uh, dirt. You can really check that it's a monolayer because of the PL. And we made a lot of devices. And with we, I mean my students in the lab. Um, and what I think is very uh, nice of them is that they also made like multiple samples of the same thickness because you can get a lot of sample to sample variations, which you don't often see in literature in, in the 2D field. But by doing this, you, for example, you have four bilayer samples. So that gives you an idea of hey, how much is the variation um, just from sample to sample, even though the thickness is the same. And then we're going to look uh, at how heat is spreading. So phonon heat. We have a te technique for that called Raman thermometry. I, I think I can skip the details of that. You basically look at the shift of a Raman peak, which is correlated with your temperature. Um, and then through a model, you can get the thermal conductivity. So let's jump to those results. So this is the thermal conductivity of our layered material, molybdenum diselenide, as a function of thickness, all the way from almost 100 layers down to a monolayer. And what you see is that the thermal conductivity is almost completely flat. So we start out with a few tens of watt per meter Kelvin, and it's still a few tens of watt per meter Kelvin, even at a monolayer. So very different behavior compared to graphene, where we saw this drop uh, of more than an order of magnitude, even for a thickness of 10 nanometers. We can go down to a thickness that is below a nanometer. This is just six angstroms, the monolayer case. Um, so what actually happens is that we start out competing silicon above a thickness of around 50 nanometers. Um, I, th I think there's there's two explanations of this, which I have in a, in, in a picture in, in a few slides. Sorry to, to again uh, delay the answer. Uh, you're too fast, yeah. So, so okay, we, we also did, uh, did theory. So the, these are up initial calculations at room temperature and elevated temperatures um, where you can calculate the thermal conductivity. I will not go into, into detail on that, but it actually matches extremely well. And one of the things that happens is that you get new phonon modes uh, that are like flexural modes for the very thinnest films. So you get a drop in the normal modes that are carrying heat around one terahertz when you start thinning down. So that would normally lead to a lower thermal conductivity, but you have these new modes, these flexural modes for the thinnest films that actually carry quite a substantial amount of heat. And that compensates the fact that you have less heat carried around one terahertz. So that's why it's so flat. So one part of the answer is you have compensating heat carrying modes uh, when you start thinning down. Um, and they can be quite long lived, so even more than uh, than 10 micron of mean free path, some of these low energy modes, which also highlights the importance of having such large uh, suspended structures. Now, OK, this is an additional effect. You can get some cooling uh, to air, which, which, is, which is maybe not so interesting. Um, so here we, we get to the rest of the explanation. So basically, the idea is that <clears throat> in a layered material, the phonons are already kind of in plane mostly because they're like these internal interfaces. So there's not a lot of diagonal phonons moving through the system. So a lot of phonons are in plane. So if you then start thinning down, there's not a lot of additional scattering at the surface. You do lose a few modes, but they're compensated by these additional flexural modes that come in. And that then gives you this flat thermal conductivity as a function of thickness. Now in silicon, the situation is very different. It's a 3D bonded material. So you have phonons going in all directions. And when you make it thinner and thinner, they're going to interact more and more at the surface. So you get scattering at the interface that starts dominating and limiting your thermal conductivity. Now, an additional fact that's uh, likely happening is that the surface roughness in a 3D material is much worse than, of course, in a 2D material. So there could be an additional effect that the surface roughness gives even more scattering when you thin down uh, more and more your, your, um, your sample material. So to conclude this part, um, what we see is that uh, this TMD, and this is actually one of the worst thermally conducting ones, so they're ones that are much better, and this one already starts outcompeting silicon in terms of thermal transport 
below a thickness of 50 nanometers. Um, so we think that's actually quite interesting, for example, for applications of, 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 of flexible uh, electronics, because at some point you want materials that have good mobilities, but also good thermal conductivity. And then at some point you reach a thickness where silicon might not be your best choice. And we do end up with these TMDs that are already in, in, in some of the roadmaps um, to be incorporated uh, for applications like this. Uh, I will probably skip this very recent. This is just a technique we developed uh, that we can use to, to look at heat transport. Uh, it's a pump probe technique. It was just published earlier this year in, in review of scientific uh, instruments. Um, and it, okay, let me just show that quickly because I, I, I'm, I'm quite proud of this. So we actually get very similar thermal conductivity as you get in the Raman thermometry measurements with the additional advantage that you don't need any material parameters. You just look at diffusion. So you just look at broadening as a function of time and then get a thermal diffusivity, which you can convert to a thermal conductivity. And the values we get match very well uh, with values measured with other techniques for these four different TMDs. Okay, that brings me to the summary of my talk. So I showed you this twisted bilayer graphene with very fast cooling at low temperatures through this umklop assisted electron phonon coupling. Um, I saw this very fast diffusion of electronic heat in the direct fluid regime. And we believe that 2D materials can actually start competing with silicon, at least for very thin films and considering their thermal transport properties. So that doesn't mean that um, they're for sure going to make it and make everything great. Um, but at least the thermal transport properties are not a, a bottleneck to start considering them for applications in transistors uh, and others. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. All right, thank you class for the very nice results and very nice talk. Do we have any questions? No, yes, yes. Thank you, very nice presentation, clear data, very, very nice. So. Uh, well, first picture you presented with cooling with twisted and not twisted. Can we see it again? Uh, let's see if I can go there quickly. Um, okay, we'll have to do it the old fashioned way. All right, now I can do that faster. Oh. Sorry, one second. Um, this one. Sometimes in uh, in cooling, uh, I think you showed some examples a little bit later. The process is not purely diffusive, or it's not just a time scale. So, uh, well, I suppose here it's just uh, errors, right? The blue curve goes uh, seems to have an oscillation on the left and not on the right. Yeah, I think this 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 um, that's a good observation. Um, I'm not sure if it's real or not. Um, my my probably not because of the symmetry, right? Because actually, what we there's there's really no no difference between one of the pulses coming first. So the fact that we don't see it on the right probably tells us that. Um, that what's happening there is indeed uh, a smaller signal um, that makes it more difficult to fit nicely uh, these cooling uh, cooling times. Yeah. And uh, you verified the, the uh, Einstein relation between diffusivity and mobility. The other part of the talk, right? Yeah. Was there any? Were there any reason to expect it wouldn't work? <laughs> Really? Uh, well, there, I mean, we, we were aware of the hydrodynamic work uh, from Columbia University, so we knew that there would be a chance of breaking wiedemann franz law. Um, we weren't sure if that was going to happen at room temperature, because, of course, their work was at, at a few tens of kelvins um, and extremely, extremely clean devices, like 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 two orders or three orders of magnitude uh, lower charge puddles than, than what we have. Um, so but we just tried and then we saw this and we thought okay that's that could be indeed this breaking of the wiedemann franz law and then in the end it it, it all ma matched out by 
being able to really scan out through this this phase space. Yeah. Here it's not with them and friends. It's uh, just uh, Einstein relation, right? Einstein relation, but you you can derive the same results if you solve Wiedemann and Franz law and um, and multi equation in, in 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 under certain uh, assumptions. You get exactly the same result. Uh, EF really here is the end mu in general, right? Yeah, so there's, um, right, so for semiconductors, there's a factor two different. So some papers actually use the wrong the wrong one because it depends on if your bands are parabolic or, or linear. Um, so you, indeed, you have to you have to do the the, the dn d mu and then you, you end up with this one. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I suppose in, uh, that was still for graphene. So in graphene, uh, but it's dope. So it's in the metallic uh, state, right? So EF still makes it. You're not uh, impeded by the Dirac uh, cone. I mean, in some sense, you're you're really in an ordinary metal in some sense. Um, well, at some point we get close to to this Dirac point, um, and um, you could indeed wonder if so. From Wiedemann Franz law, you can wonder if you would you would end up with exactly this equation. That's true. Um, because you you also do uh, the heat capacity is also in there, um, and there's a different heat capacity when you're close to the rock point and when you're far away from the rock point. So when I derived the Wiedemann Franz law and got this result, that was for a little bit away from the rock point. Um, I don't think I have checked what you get closer to the rock point. Yeah. So it might be slightly different. Yeah, that's interesting. Much. Thank you. So it, it it doesn't change anything of what we're seeing close to uh, yeah, close to time zero. Yeah. Other question? Yeah. So um, you talked about this uh, photothermoelectric effect, and so you used some p-n junction for graphene, but to break, I guess, some inversion symmetry or some symmetry, right? To reduce the symmetry uh, to Version symmetry, like molybdenum disulfide. Can you have this effect without uh, needing any PN? PN yeah. So, 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 in this case, when I was talking about symmetry breaking, it's not like 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 crystallographic symmetry breaking. It's like device symmetry breaking. It's it's on a different level. So, so basically, um, you, you need to have a different z coefficient on both sides of the junction, and that is what's breaking your symmetry and and generates a, a net current in one of the directions. And this is why if you just have a channel, you can generate you know, heat and, and charges will move, but they will move radially away. So you don't get any net current. So so it's really like like symmetry breaking on a, on a, on a device level. And and regarding TMDs, um, I'm not sure if someone has done it, um, but in principle, you, you could get the same effect. So if you can make a PN junction, the, the only thing is that there's other photo generation mechanisms that will probably dominate like photovoltaic or um, in this case, photovoltaic effect is very small. You're really dominated by the, by this photothermoelectric effect because you have such efficient heating of the electron system and light, large Z-bay coefficient. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so let's uh, thank uh, the speaker again. Thank you.